sing? Oh, I guess. Can you sing? Um, I can't sing today. Yeah. La. Um, um, yeah. No, that's Very good. It's so, karaoke. It's not singing. So we are an agency. Together, Steve and I have founded a design consultancy um, based on a report. Ba it's a report-based system of evaluation. Um, we look at the games people are making, and we help bring it closer to the game that the person wants to be making. Uh, is that a good way of describing it? It is a good way of describing it, especially after Adrian saying that we're useless. Well, yeah, and also, we're pretty selective about who we work with as well, <laughs> because if we don't think you're going to take our advice, we're not putting our name on your project because it'll be embarrassing for us when you suck. So. <laughs> Luckily, Adrian doesn't suck. Luckily, Adrian yeah. doesn't suck. Um, yes, yeah, you'll see. I'll be watching. No, um, so what are some of the things that we have done? So, um, I guess, uh, do you mean us personally? Yeah, let's talk about some examples of how we work. We've been uh, working with Indies for about a year and a half to try to sort of, whatever their goal is, they come to us, whether that's closing the communication gap, getting their game out there a little better, positioning it a little better for the desired audience that they want to connect with, or you have that thing where you're working on a game for a really long time, you kind of basically know what you want to do with it, but you don't know if it's fun yet. And you can't tell because you've been working on it most of your life for like six months and you don't know why people are catching on. And we can tell you. So that was my life before I set this company up with Lee. <laughs> that almost works. Keep going. So, um, so I, uh, my history is I used to be a games journalist. Uh, about 15 years ago I worked for a magazine called Edge. And at the end of my career at Edge, I decided I wanted to get into making video games instead. Um, and the way that that sort of, I slowly shifted from one thing to the other was the first thing that happened was I was employed to do mock reviews. Now, mock reviews are a thing that publishers and sometimes devs get you in to do right at the end of the game's dev cycle. So they um, show you a very, very, very late version of the game just before they ship and they say, okay, can you do a review as if this was gonna be an edge, but make it a bit nicer. Um, so you do that and you tell them what an external sort of oversight of the game would be, you give a review and then you maybe even give it a score or whatever. And then they take your review and they can't do anything about it because it's way too late. So they're like, are you sure? Or like, eh, kind of sucks a bit. And then they're like, oh, that's a shame. So they hand it to you, they hand it to your marketing, uh, their marketing company, and their marketing company then goes out and talks to the actual journalist and tries to mitigate against those problems. So they say, yeah, apparently people don't like games um, where all the controls are backwards. So it's don't, supposed to be like that. It's it, a psychological message. Exactly. So sell it in a different way and make the journalists feel bad if they rail against that. And then hopefully that will increase our Metacritic by 3% and we'll get our bonus. So I did that for a while, like these mock reviews, and it's basically a soulless um, uh, like task because you're not changing anything, right? You're just commenting on things, but unlike with journalism, no one's actually reading those comments apart from people whose feelings you are hurting. So <laughs> that sucked. And then I stopped doing that and went on to uh, be an actual dev via production first at Sony. I worked in production for 18 months and then left that to work for a company called, well, it was called Coogee Brighton, it was then rebranded to be Zoe Mode. Zoe ended up having three studios, uh, one in London, one in Brighton, one in San Francisco, and by that time, I was creative director at the studio. So I was working across all three of those studios doing what creative directors do. Does anyone know what that is? It's basically shitting on people's dreams. <laughs> As a creative director, you don't get to spend a lot of time on any projects. So Zoe would be working on like six projects across different parts of the world, and I would have to fly from one place to the next, go and see a team and go, yeah, I like it, but maybe the controls shouldn't be backwards. And, you know, the coder and the artist had spent eight weeks working on this, and that's all my work, and they love it, love it, love it. And I go and go, yeah, change it back, bye. And it's hard to do that without being an asshole, right? Like, but I kind of learned to try and mitigate that and talk to people and, and be better uh, and not be a dick about it. Uh, learn to look at things and solve problems in the game. So that was great. But one thing I noticed and one thing that I was really, really keen on uh, was getting outside help in to look at projects. Because 
It is so dangerous. Anyone in this room who has ever, ever worked on any kind of creative project will see this. You can't actually see what your project is from the inside. You need to step out. And every single game that I have ever, ever shipped, I've gone back to three months later and gone, what the fuck was I thinking? And it's not because I'm dumb, or not necessarily because I'm dumb. It's because you cannot see stuff from outside, the, uh, from inside the project. You need external help. You need someone objective and smart and skilled, ideally, to come in and say, okay, I see what you're trying to do, but you need to fix this and this and this. That's what I try to do as a creative director, but ideally you need someone even more external to the project to do that. So we would have employed, at Zoe, we would employ um, consultants, and, you know, I was not here for the bulk of Adrian's talk, uh, not because I knew he was going to be mean or anything. Being into consultants was only like, I, I know, many but I wasn't, I wasn't here uh, for that um, because I was busy finishing the talk that I'm going to give in a few hours' time, which is nothing like this one. Um, but I understand the point that consultants are useless because for the bulk of the time while I was at Zoe, I would, you know, we would constantly employ consultants. I thought it was really, really necessary to get grounded by outside opinion, to see from see through other people's eyes. But every time we would get a report back from one of my friends, and these are smart people, right? Um, the report would be useless, next to useless. Maybe 10% of this 2,000, 3,000 word thing would be content. The rest of it would be stuff that, you know, we tried already, stuff that wasn't the game we wanted to make, stuff that was the consultant trying to play at being a brilliant game designer and change the game to be the game that they wanted to make, things that, you know, we tried already, things that were outside of the scope of the game, things that were literally impossible to do in video games. And you know, this isn't their fault, right? These are smart people. But it's a fault with the process because consultancy is largely just someone coming in and going, yep, I'm here now, I'm going to fix your game, giving you 3,000 words, not being invested. What was the term Adrian used? No skin in the game. Skin in the game. No skin in the game. Not being invested, just coming in, flying in, dropping a report, and then taking whatever amount of money and going away. Making like grotesque hourly rates as well. So. When I quit Zoe and just was trying to work out what I was going to do with my life, I decided that was a problem that I wanted to try and fix, create good consultancy and a process that worked. And that was when I started talking to Lee. I have a background in games journalism. Um, I do a variety of things from creative and experimental writing to long form stuff to you know, mainstream uh, magazines and interviews, but for the, most of my time, as in some capacity or another, I've worked with Gamma Sutra, which is a development publication. Uh, I write about tools, I interview developers, I interview game designers, and so I've always, I've always worked really closely with, you know, I've seen the process up close in a way that consumer facing people don't often get to do. And um, one of the things that always struck me is that I'd be invited inside studios or I'd be invited to look at prototypes from some of the smartest and the best designers in the world, people that I was huge fans of, alight with enthusiasm and alight with vision and passion and talent and just would bowl me over with, you know, like, I can see bullshit. It's not that I was talking to marketing guys who lied to me. I would be talking to developers who believed in what they were doing. And I would write the story, you know, sort of cautious optimism with what the things that they told me that they were making and how the game was going to come out. And then, you know, that's that. And a year later, we see each other at GDC, and they, there's this defeated curve that a developer who shipped the game and didn't come out quite right has. <laughs> Have you seen it? They're, you know, they hey, you know, they, they know that they promised you something and they didn't do it. And it's like, what happened? And the answer is always really complicated. The answer is never the developer wasn't smart, the developer didn't care enough, or the developer didn't have a good idea. And that question of what, what happens, how does a project derail from something with clarity and enthusiasm to something that's a muddled kind of half measure, the, the question of what goes wrong there has sort of tortured me as a journalist who likes games. Um, and I would hear the stories that, you know, factors that contributed, you know, like, I knew something was going wrong, but I couldn't say so. Or, you know, our studio culture prohibits us from talking about these kind of things. Or, you know, we weren't all on the same page after all. Thing after thing after thing. And we, you know, we, we started, about, started talking about this from the perspective of what if communication skills are sort of where we begin. 
What if analysis and conversation, or how we sort of unite people around a core idea? What if we can notice the ways that people aren't communicating and spot them before they happen? What if we can tell people the minute that they start to take a foot off of that track that they were so excited to be on? And uh, so we focused on being very verbal and, and very communicative, delivering actual reports that were within scope and within budget, and uh, we wanted it to be useful. So we, de we developed a process by which we work one-on-one -on -one with teams, we do a full interview, we do a full assessment, we figure out who they are, what makes them tick, what gratifies them, what they desire to do in their project. And we compare their vision against whatever it is that they show us, and then we make recommendations. And that ordering that Lee's alluded to yeah. there is really, really important. One of the things that I personally didn't want to do is Position agency and position myself and Lee as some kind of superstar designers. Right, like, we're not doing hey, that. Hey, we're gonna fly in and we're gonna fix your problem. It's okay that you guys aren't good enough. Don't worry, we're here. These dudes are. That's not <laughs> at all. That's super obnoxious, <laughs> I, right? Nobody would hire that person. No, except they kind of do sometimes. Oh, there's a lot of pop colors arriving on the west coast. Right, right. and we, we didn't want to do that. Yeah. What we want to do is make it so that people can make there. And so the ordering of those those parts of our process is super, super important. We go into the studio, and that studio can be a, you know... A Five people too. In fact, we, we specifically work with small people, smaller teams now, because there's a lot of things that indies right now do not know how to do, and it's not their fault. It's because the traditional infrastructure has changed. Mm -hmm. All of these tasks, biz dev, marketing, QA, uh, testing, a lot of these tasks that would be handled by a parent organization no longer exist or are being done by anyone now that we don't necessarily have that incredibly hierarchical AAA or nothing. But also um, some of those expensive full-time middle management positions, you know, your sort of external dev liaison or whatever who would come in and have a look at your project every two or three, uh, two or three weeks, every month or whatever, they're gone now. And so you don't get that external vision from anywhere. Um, and some of that's a good thing, right? You don't want to have that overhead, but it's still useful to have that oversight. So our process is going in, talking to the people about the game they're trying to make. And before we see anything, before we even try and look at the game, just talking and talking and talking and interview. Um, sometimes when I talk about this, I kind of position it like that interview with Blade Runner. <laughs> but I think that's just because I have to light it up there in my eyes. I mean, we do kind of end up doing that sometimes. Yeah. We're like, so when you're designing a game, you see a tortoise. <laughs> yeah, it can be a bit like that. But yeah. and we, we, it's quite, it's, at least it's a little bit sort of formal. And, you know, we are trying to find out what you're trying to make. And, and who you are and what kind of creator you are. And by the end of that first day, Lee and I have built up an amazing picture of this super masterwork that you're trying to make. We understand why you want to make it and what it's going to be. And we're invested in it too, right? Like, it sounds amazing, we want it to exist. And not only that, we, can, we, we have, between our respective careers, enough of a bank of expertise that we can not only see what you're trying to make, but where it's going to fit, what it might get compared to, what right. kind of fans are going to, like, oh, fans of X game are going to also love your game. You know, we can sort of see where it goes in the world. So we, we listen to it, we've got this picture of it, and then we play it. And there is usually a gap, right? There is usually? No, no not no. Yes. And, and often the thing that we see is, you know, typically very, very early. So of course there's a gap. Right, so we're not expecting to see a full production work. We are able to look at a proof of concept and understand what concept is attempting to be proven. Right, but using the skills that Lee and I have of development and assessment, you know, and articulating that assessment from both sides, uh, we're able to pinpoint the gaps between the thing that you are trying to make and the thing that you are actually making. And I can see a route from this prototype or this early concept work or, you know, this, this alpha through to release and see where it's going to head up, head, and where it's going to end up. And we can divert that and bring you back on course. And we've done that. Yeah, of course, the people that we've worked with. I'm glad you asked, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've, we've been working with Mike Bethel on volume. Um, early on. Okay. Very, like very that. early Mike approached us with an early, early demo of volume. It was a prototype proving how style of mechanics. And um, we were able to help with that and provide him with a little bit of sort of trust. He didn't want to be told what to do. He wanted the perspective to, to alleviate some doubts of his own because he's a good designer and he knows what he's doing, but he wanted a systemic approach to getting outside feedback into that. 
Um, we work with Tale of Tales, who are based here in Belgium, on their Project Sunset. Um, they're an interesting case because they came to us with a particular goal. They are obviously, you know, well-beloved game developers who do, you know, very creative and innovative things. But, you know, they basically their question was, how do we make more of a mainstream game? How do we, how do we sell to people beyond game designers? Yeah, how do we get, how do we reach a broader audience? And the answer is, you know, there is a design vocabulary that we can offer you that will allow you to continue to make the game while still it's still going to be a Telltale. So game. I don't know, like you guys know Telltale's, right? Yeah. So could, can you imagine how it would be going into that studio and <laughs> saying, <laughs> "Okay, guys, <laughs> we're here. All right. Here's what you're going to do. It's going to be a match three, <laughs> but but no, stay with me. You're going to have Mark Cyrus's head in it. So yeah, going by. No, I mean that was a, that was a very particular example of how we had to work. We're we're having to work closely with the team who does who has an incredible gift, who does things in a very particular way, but wants a few pieces of advice geared toward broadening their user base, which is sort of what, what we've been working on. Um, we often find that our, because our, our, our process is so um, specific and actionable, we end up with finite recommendations that are clearly understood. It, they can help people get funded. They can help people get ready to go to Kickstarter. Uh, we recently, so there was a developer in Argentina who wanted to make a point and click game in a very competitive genre. They tried Kickstarter, they had raised like a thousand dollars of their goal and failed or something. And then they returned to us um, to have us work on their Kickstarter demo and you know, some of their outreach efforts, which you know, we did a bit. And they were successfully funded over, over their 20k goal after trying Kickstarter a second time. So pra our practical, having practical advice can help people get money as well, not just fulfill your dreams, create, you know, achieve your goals, which are all very meaningful things to us, but... And we've had people use the reports that we provide, which are essentially independent and, you know, quite formal in the style they're presented. We've had people use those reports, take them on, and use them to acquire investment afterwards. Because you can take our report and say, okay, we need, we're going to need 50k to finish this game and to implement these suggestions. We've had this external consultant come in, have a look at it. Here's what we can do with this 50k. Here's our schedule from here. Um, give us money, and apparently that works sometimes. Yeah. So that's why we. One of the reasons why we do what we do is because we derive great pleasure in unkinking this hose. Um, games are our lives. Um, we are tired of empathetically experiencing the frustrations of game development from our various positions in it. And we sort of feel this is our calling once we noticed that what we were doing was working and we had a chance to finally help people achieve their dreams. Um, I think it would be cold to assume that we don't take that really personally and that we are mm. really proud to, to put our names on the projects that we've worked with and to stand beside the people that we've helped. So the sort of point about having skin in the game is inapplicable to what we do because we wouldn't be working on these projects if we because <laughs> we wouldn't be working on that. that feels like that was going yeah sure because <laughs> we wouldn't be working on the projects if we didn't care like so in other words don't trust any other consultants only us <laughs> so one of the reasons that we don't do this is marketing we fucking hate marketing we are not marketing people we don't do marketing and that's something that we have to explain to people over and over and over again. Um, Steve is a creative person, he despises doing biz dev, and I'm a journalist, the PR machine is anathema to me, I hate it. Um, I would be happy if there was no PR, and I could just talk to the developers all the time in my, in my press works. Um, and yet, you know, that is some outreach and, and marketing is something that a lot of our teams need help with. And even when people come to us with a specific design issue, the inevitable question we get is, you know, what to do about marketing? Like, yes, agency, I love the ways you've helped us iterate on our design, but how do we sell it? What should we do about our Kickstarter page? How do we reach out to the press? And, uh, you know, we don't do, we don't, anything that you would define as marketing advice, we don't do. But, our process is geared toward improving communications, which we think is a very broad and useful concept to use. Um, we, we think that both of, both of these things are inherently connected. Yes. Design and selling your game. And if you take the Argentinian, Argentinian developer that we worked with as an example, yeah. um, they failed their Kickstarter target initially, and 
you know, they were like, oh, how can we succeed? And maybe a marketing it's, it's answer... Because we're in Argentina and no one knows about yeah. us. And we're like, that's actually not the problem when I look at this demo. Maybe the marketing answer is, okay, we've got to get you out there. Yeah. Find out who likes point and clicks. Yeah. Put it in front of them. Stalk them. <laughs> Talk to them all the time. Keep Make sure things. they know your name. <laughs> and sure, that is kind of part of it, right? There is a truth in that. But the reason this game succeeded and failed first was not because of that, it was because of some fundamental design flaws. And those were the things that we were able to fix in the consultancy. The design was not going to connect with the very high and specific expectations of the type of player who funds that type of game. It is no good that person, that evangelist for that genre seeing your game, if what they're going to do is report that it's shit. Right. So we fix that first, then we work out how you're going to talk to the right people. We always end up saying that communication begins inside of the design and it extends to the rest of the efforts around your project. So I want to clear up what, what, what do we say that game design is communication. What does communication have to do with game design? We always ask our clients, um, you know, even theoretically, like within our, within our first assessment we speak to them and say, okay, so what is your elevator pitch for this game? What is your thesis statement to this game, for this game? Let's say someone comes up to you at GDC and asks you what your game about is about, and you have 15 or 30 seconds to explain to them why they should play it. Almost no one can answer this question. Like, uh, it's, um, I, I once asked a man this and he went very confidently, addicting answer to AAA. That doesn't tell me anything. Or people say, oh, you know, it's kind of like this thing where, like, it's kind of hard to explain, but like I made these platforms, and like it's a cognitive puzzle, and I'm really into music, so there's a lot of that, and you're kind of trying to like do the both at the same time. None of that sounds fun to me. I don't want to buy that. Um, and I think you know that's fine. You know that's something we work on. I think that is a design problem, not a communication problem, because if you cannot talk excitedly, clearly, and compellingly, and focusedly about what you're doing, how are you going to realize it? How are you going to keep your team excited about it? How are you all going to stay on the same page without a clear spine of a unifying statement about what your design is? You know, if you're, if you're not, if you can't discuss it clearly and confidently, you're definitely not making it clearly and confidently. Um, I think a lack of pizza statement is a design flaw. Internally, at agency, I mean, there are a lot of terms for like the elevator pitch, right? I know Electronic Arts began the, uh, the, they called it the X and that now sort of pervades across the industry. We, we don't use the X or repeat the elevator pitch because elevators are basically awkward, right? And um, I mean, if you don't pitch me in an Like, elevator. actually these sort of like, um, um, well, it's actually like this and that. That does suit an elevator environment when everyone's looking at their toes. Um, we're more interested in an escalator pitch, right. right? Someone's going by. Someone's going by. You see the dude from Kotaku going down the escalator, and you're going up the escalator, and you're like, holy shit, this is my chance. I know he loves Taylor Swift, and I know he loves Animal Crossing, and I am making Animal Crossing meets Taylor Swift. Standing on the wire. Um, I'm getting excited about Taylor. I know. And, um, and so you're like, you see him, and you're like, is Animal Crossing meets Taylor Swift? And he's like, Holy shit. Running down the escalator. <laughs> he's like, holy shit, who was that? And when your email arrives a few days later, he's going to remember it, right? He might think you're a bit weird, but he'll remember it, and that's the first step. And all but like, <laughs> just as important as that one is having that on your wall in your studio, right? So that everything that you make in the game, everything that is important, speaks to that single escalator pitch, that single line. And the shorter that is, the more chance you have of making sure everything in your game is firing that up. And also, not you're not just adding things, scope and feature group. Exactly. Make sure that you have it contained in it and an actionable vision for what it is you're going to do. Um, I really can't emphasize it enough. Um, there is no way you can separate selling an idea from crafting an idea. Everyone's like, well, our game is great. You know, we don't need help with the design. We just need to know how to do marketing because no one's excited about it. More marketing is not going to make people excited about your game unless you can make people excited about your game face to face in 10 seconds. You know, um, as far as I know, no one is making Taylor Swift and Taylor Wolf You can have that for free. <laughs> for free, and we'll, we'll probably get really excited about it, apparently. <laughs> So we did, there are some things that we have learned from our work with clients over the past few years. Um, you haven't seen these yet because you were working on another talk, but I wrote them down for us. Confidence pieces and statements um, that are not marketing advice, but that are, that are design advice that improves communication. Um, number one, most important, well, not the most important thing, but I think it's very important to know when to show your game to people. 
Um, this requires knowing what the thesis statement is and creating a sketch of that statement that shows it off in the best light. I can tell you, I go to a lot of things. I travel to a lot of events. I give a lot of talks. I judge game jams. I host things. And people hear that like some known games journalist is there, and they just really want to show me what they're working on. And I always look because I love seeing projects in progress, and I think it's polite when someone really wants to show you something to look. But half the time, I'm tempted to say, email it to me when it's done. Don't show me it now. Because it's always like, someone's so excited, they come up to me, and they're giving me their iPad, and it's this basic sketch build of like an endless runner or a physics game where the physics aren't really implemented yet, or some 3D models moving around while the excited developer describes to me what they're going to be. As a writer, I can't do anything like that. And then let's say you email me two years later going, oh, my game is done now. I'm like, oh yeah, you're the guy with that sort of endless runner sketch. You, know, you pick your opportunity and you make sure the game is ready to talk to people, to, is ready to talk to people. Like the game, is, the game has to be able to tell the person everything. If you find yourself standing over the iPad explaining to the player what everything is, your game is not ready to show people. Um, number two is about hiring a writer. Are you sure you don't need a writer, like a real writer? Um, a lot of the times, uh, the je ne sais quoi about your favorite games is created by writers, even in games where text is not a factor. There's often a fallacy where people think, uh, there's not a lot of text, I don't need a writer. You know, writing is not just words. Like, for example, Portal is Portal because of a writer. A hundred other game developers would have just made the puzzles with the Portal gun and gone, oh, really good puzzles and mechanics are enough. I mean, Portal was made by a writer. You know, the game developers treat writing often as a disposable discipline, but a lot of the vague sense that something isn't very good comes from bad writing or poor communication. A good writer is a good communicator, is a good creative leader, and I think we've had a few projects lately where a writer has made a difference, a writer is why they got funded, a writer is why they worked, and they all were teams that didn't think they needed one in the beginning. It's also, even if you don't believe in that point yourself, believe that humans are superficial, right? We are all vacuous, led by shiny, pretty things. And text is just a part of that. If you go to a Kickstarter page and you see something bewitching, right, a pretty thing, you are way more likely to back it. If you go and see pretty words that make your heart beat faster, you will back it. And that sort of finish is super, super important. Yeah, I didn't want to actually sort through a wall of badly done text to look at your screenshots. That's, it is super important. I still, it's the biggest thing that I'm seeing game development get wrong right now. They are not ready for prime time because they think, they think the writing and the communication of the game and around the game is an afterthought. And it's just, it makes things look immature, it makes things look undone. And with the words that you do use are chaff that get in the way of why your project is exciting. Like, we've told a bunch of our teams, you know, have, have needed to hire writers without previously understanding that, that they would do that. Wanna know what item three is? I'm ready. No one cares about your Kickstarter. Mine. No. Okay. I don't hear about your Kickstarter. All right, fair enough. No, it's true. Um, like we see this a lot of the time. Like uh, Kickstarter is now a marketing point. These days, no one cares. When People... should I email the press about my Kickstarter? Never email the press about your game. I mean, there is genuinely a problem in getting the press's attention. Is that one of your later points? No. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, I have a, a radio show in London, which means I'm sort of on the periphery of press mailing lists. And I have a, um, a, an email address at that.com, which is mostly known by PRs. And I have an inbox just for that. And at the moment, my inbox for press releases about video games on, um, on Gmail is at 999 plus unread, right? A number so high that even Google cannot count which is pretty intimidating. If you want to send me a press release, I'm probably not going to read it because everyone else is doing too. And so many of those press releases are about Kickstarters coming up. That is not a story. I delete, and then, you know, as, as a member of the press myself, I know that when I get news alert, Kickstarter, that's all I need to read before I hit delete. I don't care what it is. It's not a thing. Yeah. But that's not to say you can't make it a thing by working out what the story around your game is. Because every game has an interesting story, as long as you actually give a shit about the game you're making. And if you don't, why are you making it? Like, as long as you do, there will be a story there. You have to work out what it is. And it's probably connected to that um, escalator pitch. But sending an email to someone about your Kickstarter is just a waste of your time. You know, what is your story? Why are you making the game? Why do people want to play it? And then you connect with people. You, you have to connect with individuals rather than carpet bombing emails as well. I have no idea why anyone thinks it is useful to send out mass emails that don't have any, like, just, just so you know, my game's releasing. Why are you mass spamming people? That's not doing anything. It's, it's 
also, it can genuinely hurt your chances doing that. Yeah. Again, like I met people who seem lovely, who maybe organically I would have played their game by now, mm -hmm. but before I knew them, they started sending me aggressive, ag aggressive formal mailings about their game before I even knew what it was, with a tone that I found was flippant and supposed to assume that I knew what it was, without inviting me to become interested. And I started, and then I muted them, and now when I see them, I'm like, oh, they're that person with all the emails. I receive. Emails, um, sort of, you know, what look like, obviously, that pretend to be personal emails to me about, you know, about, Hi, Steve. about the radio show, and they they begin, hey Steve, uh, really great to see everything's going so well with what I've left. I've really enjoyed reading your site and all of the informative articles on there. And I'm like, we don't have a site, we have a radio show, and it's not very good. It's definitely not informative. Um, and so that immediately turns me off, but like, I'm like, okay, delete, um, and make a mental note. Like, and it's petty, but if I'm petty, you can bet that most journalists are too. And so it's better to seek out those ones who are going to be important to you. Like, maybe it's five, or maybe it's ten. Those influencers, they don't have to be journalists, you know, they can be YouTubers, or they can be other game devs, or whatever, and contact them personally, and say, I know that you are interested in this, I really enjoy this work of yours, you know, and I'm wondering if you have any advice for me, or if you'd like to see this, this uh, demo of my game. No one wants to hand out shoutouts, supports, and likes. We're not here to, like, give you a signal boost. People want to hear good stories and connect with people who are making beautiful things. So it's important to remember, you know, what, are you, what is your story, what is your game saying, who is it saying it to, who is it saying it to, and find those people. That said, emailing the press matters less and less and less and less now. Um, your most important peers and your most important advocates, most of the time, are going to be other game developers. Collude. Do it. It contributes to this holistic community with different networks and schools of thought emerging. Not only is this going to bring you more visibility, but it brings you more creativity. You're part of your own style family, and then there's, there's the this style family from this region, and that one from that region. And every, if you're working as part of a community, everyone builds one another up. Um, and you share labor, you share best practices, and you redefine the lines of communication. Um, this way you don't end up being the hundredth guy trying to reinvent the puzzle platformer in a corner showing it to journalists before the physics really work. So, like, you know, talk work to people yes. and don't just talk about your game. Yeah, talk, talk about to their people. games too. Like, Come to like spectacular karaoke events at GDC. And, <laughs> have you heard of it? Do you know of any? Or I, uh, any uh, look, I heard there was one on Thursday night. Oh, I already have plans on it. Yeah, you're going to karaoke. I guess so. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so that that's important. Remember that a lot of the people who have the most to offer you in terms of best practices, communication, visibility, and support are going to be other developers, and you don't need to impress the press. And I say this as a member of the press. Um, so our fifth and final point um, is to like get make sure to ask for help. Get qualified outside perspective. We talk with a lot of people about agency, and they say that sounds great, but for everyone but me. Um, and you you need to know if and when you need help and how to ask for it. The work of game development is absolutely uniquely consuming. It is an all hands on, on deck, everyone keep your oars in sync kind of work. It's a symphony where the violinist also has to do the lighting and the conductor also plays drums. It takes supreme focus just to get one of the damn things finished, let alone finish in harmonious, harmonious accordance with a vision. Um, that is what perspective is for. You know, Even if you don't necessarily hire a consultant, you know, find people you can trust Give you, to give you that perspective, to let you know if your secret fears are true or not, or to let you know the people will show you the things that you don't know about your game, and you actually don't know everything about your game, which is why sometimes you're shocked when it doesn't come out the way that you thought. Very good, Lee. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. Does anyone have any questions? I can't see a thing if someone puts their hand up. Um, right now I can see. Okay. Yes! Uh, I was wondering, uh, um, it sounds like what you do is dramaturgy, um, because um, I work in the theatre myself, and what I miss in a uh, lot of modern game development is that sense of a coherent uh, story or a coherent concept throughout the work. Instead, uh, there seems to be uh, uh, more focus on is, is this a fun experience? I, yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah, so, um, uh, but you work with, uh, uh, for instance, with Tale of Tales, that might be less familiar <coughs> than other uh, teams that you work with.
every team has different uh, strengths and weaknesses, yeah. Yeah, so how do you uh, um, oscillate between those different needs? Well, it's interesting you mentioned dramaturgy because I am a conservatory trained actress and maybe that's some of the influence of my background. I didn't think I was going to become a video games journalist. I was, I was going to become a famous actress, you guys. Like, that was going to happen. Um, <laughs> but that's what I'm trained at doing. And I think a lot of the way that I approach game design and, 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 and approach working with teams is, is directorial or dramaturgical, as you say. Um, we, it's very easy to approach people with different needs because the process remains the same. We do, it's, it's, like, it's like therapy. Everyone goes, you don't go to therapy to be told what to do. You, do there to, you go to therapy to become a better you. And the steps that that is going to require depend on you know, what, you ask the, what you ask the professional for. So we do intake with people. Um, they tell us what they believe that they need. Um, we try to account for that. And we notice you know, some other needs that they maybe aren't aware that they have. And we try to account for that. So it, it allows us to work with different types of people with different goals. For example, you know, working with Tale of Tales is wildly different than working on the classic point and click adventure game. But we're able to apply our process to both. That's the thing. We're really, really proud of it. It took us like six months of, of working to refine this this process. A lot of our friends let us guinea pig on them. Yeah, uh, but it's it, it, we're really, really proud of it because we can apply it to all kinds of different situations. And Lee and I have the range of skills to solve problems in different areas as well. So um, we can't, yeah. we have different uh, backgrounds. We sort of almost come at it from two different directions, so we're able to cover the bases pretty well, I think. Um, somebody is anybody moving? Yeah. Over there. Uh, so you said you don't do any marketing or PR, but you talked about the uh, example where you helped fund the game through the second Kickstarter. Yes. Um, so how did you go about that? Kind because of the demo was better. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is the, the key, right? Like, we believe that a big part of marketing and PR is making a good video game. I mean, everyone says that, like, good video games sell, and, and that's not the whole puzzle, but if your game is if your game is developed to a degree of thoroughness and quality or with a specific direction in mind, it will connect with the desired audience. A, a project that is not aimed at a specific audience is not going to be. So one of the reasons that game got funded was because it was picked up by um, the Ron Gilbert, Ron Gilbert yeah. early because he looked at the demo that we had helped shape into something much, much better and enjoyed it. He tweeted about it and suddenly they've got another five grand on the Kickstarter. Yeah, they, they went from having a demo that was not in step with the expectations that a genre fan has. Like, you know, an adventure game fan is going to expect certain things. And indeed, that's what the Argentinian team wanted to create. They were inspired by the games of the early LucasArts days. And they, yet they didn't know how to make the design decisions in order, in order that would strike those notes. And we helped with that. Therefore, the, the second demo that they made was so in step with those notes that the very people that inspired that they were inspired by took notice and became their advocates. So, you know, that none of that was marketing work on our part. That was design feedback, but it did the work. You know what I mean? 